Bilu Ma is a faculty member in chemistry and biochemistry here at FSU. Ted Baker is a professor emeritus in computer science, and Sachin Schombeg is a professor in scientific computing. All have been reviewers and have been helpful for us in the past, and I'm really glad they could join us today. I'm going to stop sharing so you can see them. I'm going to start off by asking you some questions and um, probably have you take turns answering them uh, so we can get different, different views on this. Um, why don't we start, um, if you would please provide us your name. I already told them, told them the college you're affiliated with, so that's not necessary. And your experience with being a reviewer. So I'm Ted Baker. Yeah, I'm uh, retired now. I was professor in computer science. I worked at the National Science Foundation for about four years as a program officer. And in that capacity, I not only reviewed proposals, but I managed the review process, you know, choosing panelists and making funding decisions. Uh, so I had a lot, a lot of the inside view of this. On the other hand, a caveat here, uh, different directorates have different ways of handling proposal review. And that includes career proposals. Uh, so I have been in a few uh, panels during the last few years and uh, in different programs. Um, I think uh, uh, the reason I got invited because, uh, uh, you know, uh, they want to get some uh, ideas, uh, some areas I have been working on, and especially I have supports from NSF already. And uh, so uh, I have proposal get supported and then they will invite people who have sub uh, award uh, proposal to come in to serve in the panel. Uh, and and the program managers, especially program managers knows you. Um, and uh, uh, I think uh, the, the, the most important thing is for, for the young researchers is to establish yourself and uh, put your name out there. And, uh, you know, the, the reviewers, uh, if the reviewers know you in the field, that will be extremely helpful. My name is Sachin Shanta, and uh, maybe uh, one claim to fame is I, I submitted, I had to submit the career three times, so I failed two times uh, rather miserably. And I, uh, and writing proposals still is not easy for me. I know some people can whip out a proposal every 15 days. I can't, it's, it's still hard work. Uh, and my hope is maybe uh, some of you are like me uh, and uh, some advice that I might have uh, given to somebody like me, uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, um, is something I'd like to share with you. Yeah. And, and I've sort of reviewed on and off, you know, I, I got the career nearly a, a decade ago now. Uh, and then I've, I've reviewed career proposals on and off uh, um, almost every year uh, since then. We're going to go backwards in our, in, in, in answering this time. So we're going to keep going with you, Sach. Um, what are some of the common denominators of successful proposals you saw? Okay, so, so one, one overall comment I would make is, uh, I, I think success comes in lots of different ways. I mean, I, I, like I, uh, I, I've seen lots of, uh, I mean, the phrase that comes to mind is there are many ways to skin a cat, right? So there are uh, lots of templates for uh, what makes a proposal successful. Uh, and sort of one uh, related piece of advice that, that I would sort of uh, have is try to read a lot of proposals uh, and don't just read good proposals uh, because that, you know there may be survivorship bias uh, when you read those. Read bad proposals, good proposals, mediocre proposals, uh, just like, you know, just to, uh, just to know what works and what does not work. Uh, and, and that will be helpful. So what, if you have a chance, volunteer uh, to uh, read proposals from colleagues, from, from sort of program managers, um, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, just, just, just read a lot of proposals. What is a common thing? Yeah. Um, a good proposal. I, I can tell a story about, uh, you know, not only uh, for a career proposal, but also in general. Uh, so I was in natural lab, so I, I did not write any proposal, just, you know, a DOE support us. And after uh, I, I left uh, DOE and come to FSU, and um, like a surgeon did, I think uh, people try to put uh, as many proposals as possible. So uh, in in first few years I was here, I put uh, a lot of proposals out there, and then um, 
most of them will fail. <laughs> Uh, as you, you, you might know, actually, uh, we failed uh, at the beginning. And uh, then I met uh, uh, Caltech provost, David Terrio. Uh, David Terrio visited us uh, a few years ago, and I talked to him about uh, his experience with uh, proposals. And uh, he told me his first uh, nine proposals failed as well. So I was a little bit uh, uh, relieved. So uh, it, 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 it did not only happen to me, and, and, and it happened to him as well. And uh, one word he told me, I still uh, keep this in mind, as a persistent, persistent. And uh, especially for a young career, or I mean, I consider my, so because I changed my career from national lab to, to university, so I needed to establish myself. Uh, although I, I, I was not qualified to apply career, but still I think we go through the process to uh, gather yourself uh, known to the uh, NSL uh, program managers and the, the programs. Uh, so uh, this is something, you know, it's like uh, you keep knocking the door and uh, you, you, you put your work out there. And in the end, uh, I, I mean, most of the case, you know, you need some luck. Sure, for sure, then you need some luck. But uh, if you have solid work and uh, a body of work that you are considered as a young star, or you know you are some somebody, you, you got a name out there, uh, you gotta get recognized. And uh, as far as I know, all the the, the career award people I know and those I support them uh, to you know give good reviews and uh, to put an excellent out there. I mean they are. They actually uh, do uh, keep doing the, the the same. I mean, um, you know, being persistent. Okay, Ted. Okay, uh, common elements. I guess the most common element is creativity. Uh, a proposal that stands out among a collection that are being reviewed together on a panel or that a program officer is seeing is what you're looking for. Uh, Creativity in research, but also, especially in this program, creativity in the educational plan. I think, uh, yes, individuality, creativity, originality, I'm using all three of those terms sort of in an overlapping way. But um, when a person sees a proposal that's really good, it stands out from all the rest. And those that's, you want to be one of those. Uh, it's, it's not easy to say, but uh, it's not a formulaic process, that's for sure. You can't just go through and check all the boxes and put all the pieces together and get funded. You want to attract people's interest, fire up their imagination, get them enthusiastic about your research. So it's a sort of a sales pitch, but you have to have something to sell to begin with. Um, these other comments are all correct too. Uh, persistence is certainly important. But uh, it's not just persistence. You have to learn by the persistence. Each proposal has to be better than the one that came before. It's not a matter of just playing the odds. They off. If they fund 10%, that means I have to submit 10 proposals. No, you can submit 10 bad proposals and waste everybody's time, including yourself. So you've got to zero in on better and better ideas. Um, Another thing that I think is critical in all proposals, especially career, is to really read the solicitation carefully. Don't rely on a seminar like this to tell you about it and say, I'll just go write the proposal. There are, the solicitations are slanted for the different programs and in career in particular, there are specific things that they're looking for and you need to pay attention to those. In this case, I guess the most important one, well, there's two, I guess. The important one is that it's, the description of the career has to be there, but there has to be also a specific research program that is funded by the project. So this, unlike a normal, normal proposal, is mostly about the research you're gonna do with the money they give you. In this case, it's, there's the money they give you, which is enough to do a little bit of research, but there also has to be a plan that's larger than that, that provides the context for how this little grant 100,000 a year is going to be able to help you build this larger research plan. And uh, for people who have been successful at other grants, I think that's probably the most common failing. That's the thing that sets the successful ones apart. 
that they, they are able to provide the big picture as well as the specifics of this, this budget that's given, how it's going to be used. Okay. And Ted, we're going to keep going with you. And this is kind of the flip side, and you've touched on some of it already. But what are some of the biggest errors, missteps, things that are going to tank this for somebody applying? Okay, well, I, I'm not going to go through all of them because there are too many. Uh, I have, just for anybody's reference, on my homepage for FSU, there's a link to advice to PIs. And on that, there's a link to a set of slides that I put together. And within that set of slides, there's a section on career grants, but there's also a section on common mistakes. And it's many slides, okay? So I can't possibly go through all of those. But I'd refer anybody who's interested to go look at that because I I wrote that when I left the NSF to try to capture what I thought I had learned while I was there and what was on a whole bunch of different sets of slides and presentations we did while I was at the NSF. Um, but okay, so frequent mistakes. I think for career, I alluded to one earlier, which is to treat it like a normal grant proposal and focus exclusively on the research that you're going to do with the $500,000 that you get without giving the bigger picture. Uh, and likewise, to underplay the educational side, uh, not recognizing that this is really 50-50 education and research that they're looking for in terms of the merit. Uh, and uh, similarly, to forget to do the assessment of the educational side, most people remember to do assessment of the research success of the research part of the program without saying how they're going to assess the success of the educational program. Uh, same thing with originality. Some people have very original research, but their educational plan is, sounds like something everybody does routinely, and that's not going to excite anyone. And I know as I've, I've, I've read these over the years, a lot of times people will think, well, you know, I'll say I'm going to teach a few courses and this, and it's really no different than, you know, what they would do normally. And that is just not going to play. So yes, I've definitely seen that. Um, where are we next? We're at Boo Woo. Uh, so I, I agree. Uh, I think uh, for careers, uh, it's a slightly different from regular programs. And uh, especially, you know, career uh, are awarded to uh, young researchers uh, who will establish the program using this grant and uh, in the early stages. So I think it's very important to have a big picture. So what will be the future of this field that you are working on? and how you're going to be distinguish yourself from others or from your previous PIs. Uh, you know, this is very important. I, I know, you know, young researchers will come in to my continue working on something similar to their former advisors, uh, PhD advisor or post advisors. But how are you going to make yourself different from those two already established the PIs. So I think it's very important to, to distinguish yourself. And uh, one mistake, uh, you, you know, some we have seen like, uh, oh, you proposed something you, you were working on before. It doesn't look like uh, this is uh, your own things or something like that. Then how you build on and what you have done before and uh, to propose something you're gonna be doing next. Uh, a big picture, this, uh, this, this is very important because we want, really want to see whether uh, this young researcher has the vision and in the field and not, not very narrow as uh, uh, Ted pointed out, but uh, broad. And, uh, and we know this is like a 15 page of proposals, right? 15 page and with education and uh, all this stuff. Uh, and if you have uh, primary results, uh, during you know first one or two years uh, in the new institution, and uh, that will be very helpful and which can support you. So um, I know some some uh, one want eager to try a career right away they arrive here, but uh, maybe it will increase your possibility uh, if you try the third second year or third year once you have something uh, solid, and uh, you can show okay this is. This is a big picture. This is what I have uh, obtained so far, 
and uh, regarding persistent, you might fail the first try. But uh, if you keep working on the idea you think will be uh, will be something big, then you you can get a second time trying will be much better than first. I think that will increase the opportunity. I have a friend who is working on similar uh, uh, field I was working on. I, I was uh, uh, talking to him uh, a few uh, weeks ago. I was invited to give a talk in his institution. So he, um, i just give one example, right? So he gave the first try and uh, he didn't get, he did not get it. And, uh, and uh, but, but uh, we know he's working on some area which is highly promising. And, uh, and as a program manager actually uh, encourage him, okay? So you might come back with the same idea, but you know, uh, maybe solid uh, results a little bit more. And, uh, and uh, later, I mean, second year he got it and also get another career right, from, from, from DOE. So um, uh, this is something I, I, I said that uh, persistence is very important. You don't want to change the mind. Okay, I proposed something here uh, last year. I changed my mind to com propose something completely different, right? This, this is some mistake uh, also people might make. Oh yeah, this one doesn't work. I'll change my mind. I to, I, I'll work on something different, right? So, um, and, and, uh, and the program manager actually know you know, I, I think, you know, know who this guy is working on what, right? I, they will compare to what, you know, if, if you were in borderline last year, and this year you come in and with the, with the improved proposal, you're likely to get it. So, and I think it's very important to also, you know, pay attention to what the comments. I, I think you have the opportunity to get a fund the first time, but most likely you, you get a succeed in the second time or third time. And that's a very good point about the danger of changing topics. I know somebody that, um, you know, got, got the comments, got very hurt by the comments thinking they hate, they hate what I'm doing. They hate what I'm doing. And, um, didn't contact the program officer because sometimes they can help you read between the lines. You know, is this, is this terrible or is this just need to be adjusted? And, you know, instead went a whole other direction the second time. And, you know, that was a shame because it was way off of where it should have been. Then the third time came back, but switched directorates thinking that maybe it was for a different directorate. Well, now you have another person and it really was for the first directorate. So, you know, if the person would have stuck with it in the second, and maybe it wasn't perfect, but then the third may have gotten it, but now it, it just it just snowballed. Um, Sasha, do you want to go on from here? Yeah. So I so I actually want to say uh, I, I'll piggyback on one thing that that uh, Bu said, which I agree with. So I went after my first year, and that was. Uh, that was ill-advised. I, you know, that I hadn't put sufficient distance between me and my uh, advisors to sort of uh, know exactly, you know, what was it that was. I mean, yes, there were some novel elements, but it hadn't, like the separation hadn't been complete yet, uh, and so uh, that kind of showed. So, uh, I mean, it, this may not be true for everybody. Maybe some of you have well-defined research projects already. Uh, but uh, my bias would be to wait out the first year, just so that you know you let things develop uh, a little bit. Uh, the second thing I, I want to say, uh, and this is this is less a critique of other people's bad proposals than a critique of my my bad proposals. Okay, which which were my first few proposals, uh, and this was this was largely because most of my graduate and and postdoc training was was with papers. I mean, paper. So I I had read a lot of papers. I had written a lot of papers, um, and papers have a certain sort of format. It right? is an introduction, a method, the results, uh, and a summary. And sort of, and the only other work, at least in, in engineering, where, you know, is are, are maybe dissertations and, and thesis, which also have the same format, more or less the same format. Uh, proposals have a different cadence. They have a, they have. Uh, so, so my first few proposals looked like papers. Uh, I mean, they, they were, they were sort of, I, they, um, I fit them into a straight jacket so that you know the headings looked right, or you know the, it, it, at least superficially it seemed like it was a proposal. But you know it, it, any sort of detailed look at it, you know it, there was a paper in it. And and I want to say one, uh, I'll say one specific thing that I know I did wrong, which I sort of avoid now, uh, is 
too much detail, right? So I, I work uh, in a sort of a math heavy area. Um, you don't want to sort of introduce too much unfamiliar uh, detail, right? So when you write a paper, the method section, the hope is whoever reads the method section can reproduce your work. I don't think that's the threshold for proposals, right? Uh, in a proposal, you want to show that, uh, you know, that this can be done. And it's often just easy to sort of broadly outline you know, what you want to do. If there are certain sort of well-known sort of bottlenecks, talk about how you're going to address them and how they can be addressed. And it's best to sort of, you know, like uh, show, don't tell, right? So just say, okay, I've, you know, this is my plan and this works on this uh, sort of uh, small problem and just show that result, right? So uh, cut, the, cut the detail, right? So spare, uh, I, I think, it, and then it, it just miraculously your proposals read better, you know, just this having to focus on, you know, sort of uh, having to zoom out con constantly uh, as, you, as you write the proposal sort of helps. Uh, I, and I think that's sort of one, one sort of good, uh, I, I think one common theme that I observe in lots of successful proposals uh, is that because they, you know, they, they're not too close to the ground, they're, they're sufficiently removed, uh, it automatically provides uh, different hooks for different people to get into, right? So your proposal is not going to be reviewed by one person. It's going to be reviewed by like a bunch of people. It could be five. Uh, maybe one or two are experts in the area who can actually, you know, like who would review a paper, for instance, and who, you know, who can sort of comment, um, who are technically completely uh, suited to sort of uh, give you fine level uh, commentary on it. But, but most of them, I mean, it's, it's quite likely that two or three of the reviewers, uh, I mean, are, are adjacent. They know certain things around the area, but they may not be sort of complete uh, experts in, 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 in the particular. And so you want to get them, you know, like you keeping things uh, like slightly uh, zoomed out helps them to sort of connect with the proposal, right? So it gives them a hook. Uh, and, and, you know, um, I, okay, I, I, I lost track of the question, but uh, that's what came to my mind. You're doing great. Did anybody else have, any of you three have other thoughts as any of them were talking that you would like to mention before we move on? Uh, I certainly agree with all the things that were said. There. I, 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 you know, I, I'm not sure if, if, um, um, all these uh, who are applying for career have experience with uh, uh, NSO panel review. But uh, if you get opportunity to go to NSF to serve in the panel, do it. And also uh, talk to program managers uh, as much as you can. Uh, I mean, you know, feedback, certainly you need to talk then discuss what you can do. But before that, I think it will be helpful um, and uh, so in the panel, if possible, uh, and um, knowing the format, because uh, as, uh, it, it eventually will be people who judge your work, right? And uh, a lot of times it's like, uh, we, got, we are going to compare those, these proposals and we're gonna rank them, right? It's, sometimes we have a bunch of good proposals Right. Sometimes we might have bad proposals, and uh, we all rank them in order. Okay, this batch. Okay, this will be the the best one, right? And uh, so it's very important. So if you can know, okay, this this panel or this this uh, this panel, which panel you're gonna be in, and uh, and uh, what. A, what it will be like, uh, you know, you something you're gonna be competing with, right? Eventually, we are gonna you know, propose a more or less. This is a small field, actually, for something you're working on. It's a very small field. I'd like to add a couple of things you just stimulated here. Uh, one is about being on a panel. The way you get recruited to a panel is to volunteer. Don't wait for someone to contact you. Yep. Uh, contact all of the program officers that might possibly appear to be in an area that's related to your research. Send them an email with a short bio, a link to your home page with a bio on it, a summary of your research area, which is short enough they can read it in one glance. And uh, say, I want to serve on panels. Keep me in mind. Add me to your list of panelists. Um, the people are always looking for panelists, but they're not going to just stumble on you because there are hundreds of thousands of people out there in academic jobs. Uh, 
and especially when you're starting out. Uh, after a while, you may be known as an expert in a given area, but when you're starting out, you're not that known. And there's actually an incentive for program officers to bring in new people. They're trying, but they, you need to help them out. The nature of the research uh, standing out. Okay, um, when we try to publish papers in our research areas, whether it be a journal or a conference, we focus the paper for the audience of experts in that area. And we benefit from that, and sometimes to the extreme. I know there are conferences, for example, where everyone who's interested in that conference is really hot on the subject of research and thinks it's one of the most important thing around. And uh, they don't have to be sold on the importance of the research because they're in the area already. Uh, it, it gets so extreme that there are certain conferences you could submit to and you almost guarantee you to be accepted because everybody there likes the kind of research you're doing. Uh, with NSF, you have to assume that there are a lot of skeptics out there and they not only won't know about your research, but they may take some serious convincing that your research is important meaning that it has an impact on the real world or impact on terms of enabling further research. So uh, the, sales, the sales pitch aspect of the proposal, successful proposal is really a lot different than anything else you would ever write. Um, and you've got to keep that in mind. And I think that's a good point. Um, Sachin brought that up too, the difference of persuasive writing versus writing for publications. Um, it, it is a very different style of writing. And if you haven't written a proposal and that this is something you're not going to be comfortable with or it's your first time, I would recommend that you please reach out to our office to have us look at your proposal and maybe give some suggestions um, or help you get on track it, because, you know, you do have people who are not used to that and you can see it and we can, we can help you if you come to us early enough so that there's time for some back and forth. So um, we have had a lot of questions come in. I'm just going to go down, down the line here. Um, the first question we had is, and whoever wants to take this one, go ahead. What is the chance of an NSF proposal being accepted without having preliminary data or results? I will say very slim in my area. And within my area, you see, it depends on the nature of the proposal. Uh, a theoretical proposal, where are doing theoretical research, uh, a lot of times you aren't going to have preliminary results, except in the sense that by analogy to results that have, are similar in terms of plausibility of the approach or the technique that you're applying. But you at least need a sort of back of the envelope sort of argument for the plausibility of your research, even if you don't actually have data. Because um, you, you have to convince the reader somehow that you're likely to succeed, or at least you have a good chance of success. If, it's, if you're guaranteed success, then it's not interesting. I mean, if you've already solved the problem, why are we paying money for it? The plausibility has to be established by one means or another, and preliminary results are a great way to do that as long as you haven't gotten too good at preliminary results and I've seen that happen before where people actually have published their proposal reads a lot like the preliminary result paper and you go to read the paper and you see that they've really accomplished half of the research that they're proposing already. That's, that's an equal danger. You need to get the balance. Uh, you, you cannot certainly propose something has been done. Uh, and because there, there will be a, a, a panel, there will be uh, dozens of proposals, right? And if we review all these proposals, we see one with just no primary results and or whatsoever, that's a good idea. And this guy is the first try, okay? Most likely what will happen as program manager and the reviewer will say, oh, maybe you, can, you should come back, okay? This is a good idea. And uh, when we write the summary or comments, you know, there's a strength, weakness, and uh, in the summary, we might put some words like, this is a great idea, but we would like to see if this could be some primary results or something to support your claim. And the, this will likely happen to the first try to your proposal if you don't have any primary results. But if you say you are trying the third time the, and it's still without the primary results and the results, 
then you look likely you'll fail. I mean, you you doesn't seem you do not seem to be a promising researcher if you, it's your third try, right? So it, it, program manager will and and the reviewer will evaluate all these situations. Okay, whether this is your first try, second try, or third try, I I don't know. Ted is a program manager, but sometimes oh, definitely true. Yeah, yeah, take this into account, right? So. I, I, I think the, the chance you get accepted without a primary results, it's, a, it's a very minimal. A lot of proposals get accepted on the third try and few on the first try. And as you, just as you said, you, by the second try, you better have some kind of something to show you. It should have been working on the problem during that year. You shouldn't be reproposing from the start, same starting point that you were the year before. Well, let's go to our next question. How shall we demonstrate the potential for future works based on what we have done? For example, in social sciences, we often spend years to do only one experiment for our turnaround time is very long. That means our publications are very closely related to what we do in the next several. Then how shall we distinguish what I have done and my future work? I don't know what to say because it's a social science, but I, it is critical that within a proposal, you clearly delineate what you've already done and what you're proposing to do. Uh, if a proposal doesn't make that clear distinction, it's likely to fail. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I'd, I'd, I'd add is, you know, like the, the proposal, it, it's a, it's a five-year proposal, right? So you're going to do some amount of work over those five years. And there, ha there has to be some way to evaluate. It, it may not be sort of the the complete endpoint. I mean, I mean, when is there ever a complete endpoint to any research? But you know, like at, at the end of five years, you should be able to evaluate. I think uh, whether what you did over those five years uh, was successful or not, or maybe it's not binary. But you know, uh, you should be able to evaluate the work that was done over the course of the proposal. That's right, and evaluation doesn't necessarily mean publication, right? I mean, there should you should be continually evaluating the results of what you're doing even though it hasn't been published. So I'm not sure that, I know the publication cycles can be very long. In theoretical computer science, two years for a journal publication is what I experienced typically. A year to get the first set of reviews back and then another year negotiating with the referees and the editor trying to get them to finally accept your paper. Uh, but in the meantime, you certainly have preliminary results you can publish as technical reports and put on your website and so on. You should be doing that to protect yourself, in fact, from other people scooping you on your research. If you wait until the final journal publication, someone else may come up and done the same thing and made your research irrelevant. So uh, I, if it's a matter of, the delay is a matter of gathering data, that's unavoidable, it's gonna take a while, but five years is pretty long. You should be, uh, you have enough time before the proposal is over and oh, and remember that this is a proposal as part of a long-term research program. So it's not just one experiment you're doing. There should be a lot of branching off of activities going on over these five years and a revision of your plans as the proposal, as a project progresses based on the results you've got. Uh, but I, the bottom line of the question is how do we distinguish what I've done in my future work? I, the answer is simple. You describe what I've done, period, okay? And then you describe what you're going to do and they should be separate. Uh, if they're not separate, it's not going to succeed. Yep. Uh, I want to add a couple of things here. So publications are not the only way to show your work. You get an opportunity to go to the conference. Yeah. You're going to get an opportunity to visit different universities and uh, talk to your colleagues, call, talk to people in the field, and let the people know your work, although there are no publications yet, but the people can know your work. And regarding putting on a career proposal, this is a career. This is, will be your career, not only five years, I think. This is, could be 10 years or 10, 20 years. You're working in a field with big challenges and the issues, which you should, you should be able to identify, okay? I, I think it's very important to convince the reviewers and the, the, uh, the program manager that this is something very important, something I'm working on. And this is just a start of the, my career. So, and, uh, and this is very important. This is different from, uh, from the regular programs, right? So, so what do we want, really want to see is whether this guy has the potential to deliver something big, okay? And what do you propose? Okay, you've done something 
that's great. That's great, right? So you you have you show this, and uh, based on that, what do you see in the future? Okay, so I, I we really want to the the uh, the career award to become leaders in the field in the future. That's the expectations. I mean, program manager and the reviewers have. I'd like to emphasize the last thing you said. I've seen a lot of proposals that failed on that. That is, when you look at the proposal, you say, oh, this is reasonable research, but this looks an awful lot like research a lot of other people are doing. This person is going to be one of a crowd of dozens or hundreds of people doing similar research. You've got to have a plan in the proposal that plausibly allows you to separate yourself, to put your head up above. This is me. I'm doing something different from the rest. If, it, if you can't do that by the time you're five, six years out, no one's, you're not going to be recognized other than just as one of the players. You won't be a, a leader. Yeah, I think that's that's how we get get recognized in the community or in science or in in social science as the worker uh, connected to the people. Okay, you are famous or you are known because of what? That's yeah. your work, right? Right. So that's the thing you want to you want to state in the proposal that five years from now I want to be famous for and you fill in the blank. Yeah. So let's let's move to another question here. Um, should we describe how we can evaluate the success of all of the proposed activities, research, educational, outreach? So should we describe it? Yes. That's the question. Simple, yes. Any, anybody want to go on any further about that? Yeah, so sometimes I feel like it's, you have to do work in, in order to figure out how to sort of describe success. But, you know, there is an activity and uh, there is some measure of success, you know, and, and uh, uh, it t sometimes it'll take some sort of creativity in order to sort of figure out what you want to measure and what, you know, what uh, the threshold for that metric has to be for it to constitute success. Uh, but I, I like, you know, even when you propose, I feel like that you have to keep that at the back of your mind. Um, so for example, could you say something like, I plan to work with X number of students, or by the time this is completed, I will have, I have, I will have trained X number of grad students. Or is it would something like that be appropriate? That's kind of unimaginative and kind of secondary, I would say. If you're talking about, suppose you're developing a new course, and how do you evaluate the success of a new course? Well, number one, can you get students to sign up for it, right? But then you ought to look at the impact that the courses has on the students years out. Uh, you should not at the, just stop at the end of the term, but you should follow up with the students who took the course one year out, two years out. In this case, we have five years. You can do five years out and uh, find out whether they felt that the course was valuable to them. I, I didn't do it enough in my life, I think, but I definitely remember the times that students sent me emails or letters saying, you know, Professor Baker, I still remember this particular course, my, your algorithms class, I, the most valuable class I ever took, something like that. When you get those kind of comments, you feel like you're succeeding. And I never, I think I made a mistake not trying to actually solicit them by polling my students later to, to get their ideas about whether a course was actually useful when they got out into their jobs or succeeding courses. Um, so I think planning on some kind of uh, longitudinal evaluation would be useful in the case of a course. If you're talking about recruiting, say, minority students, well, they, maybe headcounts are useful there. Um, other so, ideas? Yeah. So, so like, I, I want to sort of say two, two things. So one is, even if you're doing a new course, uh, I mean, you could, you could piggyback on something like the spot forms. Uh, just to get, you know, like the, you could pick up if, if people will, if there are thoughtful sort of reviews that are written, maybe you can, you can use that uh, as, as a way of sort of qualitative evaluation as well. Uh, yeah. One of the things I proposed was to, uh, when, you know, and this, you can tell that this, you know, this probably won't fly today, but uh, I used to teach like a, a thermodynamics class in chemical engineering at the time. And one of my goals was to introduce, so things that could be done on a computer, things that could be, you know, I wanted that done, you know, so I wanted to introduce more sort of compu a computational flavor 
within the existing traditional thermodynamics class. Uh, and then I just kept a tab of how many sort of introductions I made. I mean, it, it, uh, like the evaluation may not be, you know, like I just, you know, I said, okay, I, I you know, these many new exercises, these many new programs. Uh, and so that was one way of sort of just, just counting something that would, that would, uh, it's, it's not exactly what you propose, but it's a proxy for, uh, you know, the activities that, that, that you propose. I mean, um, so, so some, I, I feel like sometimes you just have to, uh, uh, right, so sort of think, you know, you, 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 like you, you may say, okay, I will do this outreach event, uh, but then maybe sort of think about, maybe you keep a guest book there uh, just to solicit comments and, and or mm -hmm. maybe just count, I mean, count the number of people, just uh, when people come in, maybe you sort of, you know, segment them, figure out how many high school students, like anything, anything that you can measure out of any activity, uh, you, should, you should try and measure. Uh, you may, you know, like not everything may be useful, but some of those measurements will be useful proxies for the activities that you're actually trying to do. Uh, so, so basically, award. Uh, this is a proposal. This is something you propose to do. Certainly, you needed to have certain goals, right? You, I want to plan to work on this with the targets. This, uh, these are the goals I want to realize. And then, for any activity, research, educational, or outreach. So you set up this. This, this will be my goals after five years. And uh, then you needed to put out some way, okay, so how, how I can tell that uh, this goal could be realized, okay? So you certainly need to set up uh, these goals are reasonable to reach, and uh, you have the plans of how I can uh, things exercised to reach these goals. And then how you gonna evaluate whether I reach these goals or not. Okay, so, so the, and I think uh, panel reviewers will look carefully on this Okay, first, uh, whether these goals are meaningful and, uh, uh, you know, after you, you realize this could be something really move the field forward or something like a benefit. And, and, and uh, I think a career award as the, uh, also have the sections about the broad impact or these things, right? Education is a big uh, component. So I, I think you, you certainly need to emphasize this. Okay, so what do I do well, well to achieve these goals and uh, I have these ways to evaluate. Well, and by the way, a lot of proposals I've seen will have a letter of collaboration from someone at the university's office of teaching improvement or whatever they call it, the, the university level people that are supposed to mentor new faculty members to help them improve the quality of their teaching. Uh, that's a, sort of a freebie in a sense. I mean, you talk to somebody there, get them to write a letter stating that they're going to audit some of your classes, they're going to give you uh, mentorship. Uh, it shows that you're taking advantage of the resources that are there. And it, like I said, it's, it's, you don't have to do anything additional beyond talking to somebody in that office to get that letter. Uh, I, you know, career award, I think uh, you know, education component is, a, is, a, is, is very important and maybe more important than regular programs. Regular proposals uh, have less emphasis on, on the ed outreach or education, but for career, um, you're right in store. And, but uh, our job as professors or researchers is to also educate, you know, the general public and the new generation researchers and and uh, young mind, minds. So, so, so I think it's very important, uh, not only, you know, oh, I got this done, but not benefiting the society. So education is, is very important. And I think it's a, there should be a way to evaluate. Okay. Um, I think the other part of that, and I think you've covered it, the question was, should, should you, um, should, should your uh, analysis be quantitative for some activities? It's hard to quantitatively evaluate the success. Is there any other thing you would want to add to that? Only that, in my experience, that's usually a cop out if you say that. If you, if you can't find a way to do it quantitatively, you probably have not defined success well enough. It may be a second, it may not be a direct measurement. You have to make, do indirect measurements, but there's always something you should be able to, to, 
to quantify. And, or as we were saying, maybe there's five different things and none of them are sufficient in themselves, but put together, maybe they, they do. Okay. And I think what you had mentioned earlier, Ted, was maybe the Center for the Advancement of Teaching. That's uh, what it's called sorry. nowadays, yeah. And our office is, is now involved in research mentoring, so that could be a component of that as well. So just wanted to mention those things. So, um, and as Ellen says, and I bet you she'll bring up in a little while, there are ways to, to quantify, quantitatively evaluate teaching. And we, when Ellen, Ellen is in our next session and I, we will have her go into that more then. So I have one more question uh, to ask. Um, last, last question, if you could give one piece of advice, something maybe we haven't covered, something that would be essential that they need to walk away with, what would that be? Sasha, let's start with you. Okay, so I'll, I'll tell you something that may not be directly related to proposal writing, but maybe sort of, sort of, you know, sort of the broader uh, uh, sort of thing of managing your sort of research. Okay, uh, so I so so I am not somebody who uh, can sort of network uh, easily, right? I, like I can't put the charm offensive on and sort of go into a group and just you know, uh, and and networking is is sort of important. Uh, I mean, over a period of time, because. Uh, people are kinder to people they know, right? So even when they when they review stuff, if they know you, and, and it's I, I I don't mean you know I don't mean this as as uh, as manipulating sort of the the jury, but but rather you know like you just uh, you know you want to make yourself known, attach a face. Uh, so one way that, that is helpful for maybe introverts uh, uh, is uh, is to use email, right? So uh, I mean, so let's say there is somebody who's. So, sort of, you know, at least peripherally in your area, he could be on your, you know, could be on, on, on your career proposal, but, you know, eventually maybe he's on your, he'll write a letter for you during your tenure or, or what have you. Uh, it's never a bad idea to sort of, uh, especially if, you, if you're following their work to sort of reach out with an email, you know, maybe there's a question, maybe there's a comment on how it relates. Uh, so just, just getting yourself known through sort of maybe, no, uh, via email uh, is, is I, I, I found that sort of, you know, and sometimes that opens up sort of, you know, maybe you just wanted to say something about a paper, but you, you know, uh, you strike up a conversation and, and that person becomes a collaborator soon enough, which is sort of, sort of an even better outcome, right? Um, so uh, just, just something that I wanted to throw out. Yeah, I, I agree with you totally. Being an introvert myself, I had to overcome this and only succeeded very late in life. <laughs> But I think that uh, serving on NSF panels is one way of establishing these links. It goes back to this volunteering. Uh, of course, if you can get on program committees for conferences in your field, those program committee meetings are another great way to establish connections. Um, so that's, I'll endorse that advice. I will say, be yourself and be con uh, persistent. And uh, being also, I means you are you in the field. So uh, being yourself and working on something you think is important. And uh, certainly you, you need, you, w how you think you, your, some work you, you work on is important. You need to get others' opinions as well, right? So through talking to your colleagues, through talking to the program managers, and, uh, and then you know this is important, something I work on. I, this is something big in, the, in my career. Then you stay on this and uh, steadily build up your reputation and uh, uh, to be successful. So I, that's, that's something, uh, you know, uh, as far as I have been in all these panel reviews, all the, all the recommendations I have made to all these awards, these guys eventually all established and become, you know, young leaders in the field. I, yeah, I'd like to add something. I just thought of. Uh, I can't say that I ever had a plan for my career. Many things I stumbled on, and then just having discovered them was able to exploit them further in my career. But the, I think almost every single really creative idea I had, I could not have anticipated until I had it. 
And so writing proposal for that kind of thing is quite difficult because well, you can't anticipate these flashes of creativity that you get. Um, when you do get one, of course, then you can try to exploit it in terms of following it up with research proposals. But uh, what, I'm, what I say now, it sound, may sound a little bit funny because I don't, I'm not endorsing people being disingenuous or putting on X, but uh, a lot of successful research proposals are bold to the point of uh, promising things that the PI isn't even sure they can deliver. Uh, exciting ideas that might lead to success and the PI has to, and the reviewer sometimes have to suspend disbelief a little bit in order to, 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 to believe it's, to, it's actually going to happen. But uh, to, to be brave in the sense of going out on a limb as long as you have some reasonable preliminary results or reasonable examples that can sort of support the plausibility is better than being conservative and just proposing something you know you can do. Okay, so, if, so if you propose fi my five-year program is gonna do A, B, C, D, and it turns out you can't get past A in reality, but you got the money, okay? The fact you couldn't do B, C, D is, nobody cares about because you're going to think of F, something else, you know, over that five years, you're going to redirect the research using that money and come up with something else creative if the first ideas that you had didn't all pan out completely the way you planned. So I would be, not, be a, not hold back from, from being ambitious at the same time as you do want to, uh, if you ever do get funded, of course, you want your annual reports. So if you change the direction of the research, you need to inform the program officer. They won't take your grant away, but you need to keep them up to date about how you've redirected the research. But I mean, don't feel that you're making a commitment to something that might not work. You always have a chance to redirect the research if it turns out that your initial plan isn't exactly as great as you claimed it was. But um, I hope that it's clear. I mean, it's, it, it's a matter of selling and exciting people about your research. It doesn't hurt to go overboard a little bit. I myself had to fight that because I'm very conservative. I don't like to promise anything unless I'm certain I can deliver it. And that would certainly be the case, for example, if I'm doing software development. I wouldn't want to promise something to be done faster or cheaper than I could do it. But if it's research and it's really out on fringes, you have to be willing to to take some risks and maybe make some claims that you're not absolutely certain you can live up to. I know I've seen in some other, some uh, at least one career proposal that basically would say, so if I'm gonna do this and this is what I anticipate, if this isn't what happens, that's okay because it'll still lead me to be able to continue to do this. So one does isn't, isn't going to stop if you can't do it, you know, like giving the, giving the reviewer, uh, I've already thought that, you know, there is a chance that this doesn't pan out exactly the way, but that's okay because we can still keep moving forward.